So it's a great pleasure to welcome everyone back to today's symposium. And the reason why we are holding the symposium at a different time is to have the opportunity to invite colleagues from Asia. Um, as our frequent viewers know, we have not yet had speakers from Asia uh, because it's nearly midnight uh, during our normal seminar time. So for today, in order for us to invite key contributors from Asia, we're switching to Thursday afternoon in Stanford. And therefore, it is my great pleasure to welcome two outstanding researchers from China and from South Korea. We're really delighted to be able to have their perspective. Uh, we have Professor Han Lee and Professor Kisuk Khan who will join us today to share their academic perspective on battery research, but also to give a little bit insight to what is happening in China and South Korea, which are, of course, key powerhouse uh, in energy storage today. So first, we're going to have Professor Lee give a lecture. So let me go ahead and introduce uh, Professor Han Lee. Uh, Professor Hong Li is uh, at the Institute of Physics in the Ch Chinese Academy of Sciences. Uh, I will make a personal note that he is uh, basically my academic uncle um, because uh, he and my PhD advisor um, uh, share a common route in their postdoctoral training at the Max Planck Institute in Stuttgart. Uh, so uh, it's great to have my uncle here today speaking to all of us. And uh, Professor Li is extremely experienced in solid state ionics. Uh, this is his fundamental area of research. And he has been able to apply these understanding to many technologies, including um, battery um, and related application. Um, Professor Li is a very prominent researcher in China, having founded a number of institute focused on developing energy storage, for example, the Tianmu Lake Institute for Energy Storage and the Yangtze River Physical Research Center, where he directs a very large team trying to pioneer a fundamental understanding and also translation for energy storage. And I know that recently he has been very interested in solid state batteries. I know this is a topic of great interest to many of the listeners as well. So today we're delighted to have Professor Lee speak about solid state batteries uh, specifically from fundamentals to application. So Han, thank you very much for joining us from China. And we are uh, very much looking forward to your lecture. Oh, thanks, William. Yeah, uh, it's really my great pleasure to be invited by uh, William and E. And also, I, I would like to thank uh, Tracy, Justin, Davy, Jimmy, and Kelly to organizing this wonderful symposium. So, uh, dear friends, good morning and good evening. It's my pleasure to share our experience uh, on the solid state batteries towards practical applications. Today, I will uh, share some results from four affiliations, including Institute of Physics and the Beijing Vila New Energy Technology, a company to develop solid state battery and also TM Lake excellent anode materials, the raised silicon anode materials and also a nano-sized solid electrolyte and also TM Lake Institute of Advanced Energy Storage Te Techniques. I, as you, as everybody knows that battery now is really have a broad applications, including every, uh, every field in the human societies, including 3C electronics and very important, the transportation, including the bicycle and car and bus and even ship and the train and also airplane. So electric airplane has been proposed now. And also another very important topic is to join the renewable energy and the smart grid to balance the, uh, uh, to balance the electricity. And those two market from transportation and uh, 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 stationary energies is very large market. According to a rough estimation, it could be larger than the 10 pegawatt hour markets. So also, a battery can be used in many other uh, niche markets. So those, those themes, uh, the batteries, will be very important in next 10 or even 30 years. 
So if you look at the current status of commercial lithium batteries, uh, here I just make a summary of the 3C electric vehicle and the stationary storage of three types of the batteries. So the 3C care about the volumetric energy density. Electric vehicles care both gravimetric energy density and volumetric energy density and the cycle life, especially the safety and also stationary storage care about the cycle life and the calendar life. And also the, both of them uh, care about the uh, read performance and also the temperature range. And especially for electric vehicle and the stationary care a lot about the cost. So however, although we have spent 30 years for developing the lithium battery still, the energy density, charging rate, cycle life, and also operating temperature range. And in some case, for especially for high energy density batteries, the volume deformation are still a problem and also cost is slightly high. So another very serious concern is the safety. We have heard a lot of accident. So because the use of the non-aqueous electrolyte, so when we increase the temperature, it costs by a lot of reasons. So the battery will go to the thermal runaway and finally could cause the fire and even uh, explosion. So this is a really uh, a very serious concern, especially on the big batteries used in the electric vehicle and the stationary applications. So today I want to introduce briefly about the uh, advantages and also challenge of our solid state lithium batteries and also propose the problems and the possible solutions. And also I will especially introduce our effort on the in-situ solidification and finally give a roadmap of commercialization. Uh, as well known uh, by the audience that uh, the solid state battery is uh, really different with the liquid one, because you change the <coughs> contact from the liquid to solid, to the solid to solid contact. Uh, with the application of the solid electrolyte, you can have the possibility to use the high voltage cathode and also even lithium anode. And also because of the free of the thermal runaway, uh, you, you can increase the safety and also because lack of the <coughs> capacity far over so the cycle life could be extended for very long and also because the free of the liquid electrolyte you can consider to to do the internal series to get a very high packing efficiency those are possible advantages but have not confirmed by the commercial product of the r solid batteries those are we expected advantages. So now I want to introduce currently, there are four types of our solid state lithium batteries. Firstly is the polymer. The polymer type of our solid state battery has been started since 1978 from the Michel Armand. So the polymer electrolyte has the disadvantage of low electronic, uh, ionic, con low ionic conductivities and also the, uh, the advantage is high trans transference number it has poor mechanical stress. And especially for PEO, it could be oxidized even above 3.9 volt. And also for the anode interface, it's still not very good. So uh, currently, because of the limitation of the oxidation voltage, so the polymer-based ASLB has not been used widely, only for some demonstration in electric vehicles. And there are some, there are also a lot of great effort to improve, like to, to design the composite and the multi-layer electrolyte, and also introduce the polymerization of lithium salt, and also surface modification of cancer to decrease the surface oxidation, and also change the stability of the lithium. So those efforts have still are going on. For the thin film, lipen based, this has been developed very well, especially used for the <coughs> IoT applications. But this type of the solid state battery has a high cost and the low production rate. And it's very difficult to scale up and also has a limited energy density, especially volumetric energy density and gravimetric energy density in the pack level. So uh, in order to increase, the energy density, you can consider 3D and also thicker electrode and the multiple layer pack. But however, limited by the same film uh, production technology, still 
you cannot uh, increase the production rate very quickly. So this is still limited significantly. And another very important our solid state lithium battery is used the sulfide. Sulfide electrolyte has very high ionic conductivity. So it's very attractive and there are a lot of effort from Japan, from Korea, from uh, USA, Germany, and China. But currently the sulfide, because it's very air sensitive, so the production processing should be very careful in a very dry room. And the, also the precursor and the product uh, processing are very highly cost. So currently it's really difficult in, in view of the cost performance issues. And also currently still the scaling up uh, technology has not been developed very well for the large production, but those problem can be solved by developing the electrolyte, which are not air sensitive and also which can uh, suit for the dry coating technology and also to do the some other technology to increase the uh, <coughs> production rate. So those efforts have been developed very well right, right, uh, right now. And but still it's in this year and also in I think in a few years, it's still very difficult to, to get a very large scale production. And oxide based electrolyte has been attracted attention for a long time because of the stability issue. However, the ionic conductivity is not so high. The highest one is garnet, it's like one millisiemens per centimeters, but it could be used for the design of batteries. However, if you use the ceramic pellet, so it's quite fragile. So it's difficult to, to do the stacking technology. And also, of course, the, the physical contact between the solid electrolyte and also the electrode is very difficult to deal with, especially during the cycling, which has the significant volume change. And also the interface stability to lithium for some oxide electrolytes still a problem. And also still, if you uh, use this kind of design still difficult for the mass production. So according to this uh, uh, summary, looks like the r solid battery are still difficult to scale up because of all kinds of challenge. And for the real applications, uh, the demanding for the performance is a combination. So we need high safety, we need high energy density, and we need a long cycle life and the reasonable rate. And also we should operate at a very low temperature up to high temperature. And especially the cost should be comparable to the non-aqueous lithium batteries. And in order to real mass production, you need to consider the performances, the combination of performances should, uh, should be superior compared to the lithium ion batteries, non-aqueous. And also the production speed should be very fast. And also you should have a major supply chain for developing these all solid state batteries, but still very difficult. So how to solve this problem? So we have proposed, is it a pass that we just do the hybrid solid liquid electrolyte, which could have the uh, opportunity and could have the, uh, it could be pre prepared in a faster way. So if you, we have a hybrid solid liquid electrolyte, so we could consider several strategies. So for, for example, we can coat the solid electrolyte on the electron material particles to decrease the surface oxidation. And also we can introduce the solid electrolyte particle or the, or the polymer uh, electrolyte into the separator or between the particles in the electrode. And also we can form in the solid electrolyte in the electrode and the cell where in situ solidification. If we have this kind of consideration and a strategy, it looks like it could be easily to be produced and also could have the high safety and the low cost, which is very important. And which uh, for the production, it could compatible with the existing processing technology and the equipment, and also could use a lot of available materials. So with this, uh, uh, demanding and uh, consideration, we propose the so-called hybrid electrolyte lithium-ion batteries where in-situ solidification. So I will uh, explain briefly. Firstly, we use the anode side, which high energy density anode, which can, we could consider silicon and also lithiated carbon and uh, with the solid electrolyte and also the ICI at anode side. 
in the cancer side, we could use the solid electrolyte coated cancer particles. And with the solid electrolyte and also the in-situ form, the SCI and also CEI at cancer side. And for the separate, so at the first generation, we could combine with current the ceramic coated separators. We can consider still use the uh, polyolefin based separate like PPPE as a substrate and the coated uh, inorganic oxide solid electrolyte on the one side and also on another side and combine with gel polymer uh, compositions. So with this technology, we can fabricate the batteries with the similar technology, but we inject a, a new electrolyte. With this new electrolyte, we will convert liquid into the solid electrolyte where the reaction like SEI, CEI, and also the polymerization are precising. So with this kind of design in principle, we could have the possibility to balance the requirement and to use the, with the high voltage cancer and lithium contained anode, and also could free of thermal runaway and also with the reasonable kinetic properties with a reasonable rate performance and which could operate at low temperature or high temperature at the same time. And also possibly we can control the volume variation. This is very important issues. And all, of course, so you see this processing and its uh, design. So it is comparable to current technology. So the cost is not, we could not, uh, we do not in, uh, increase the cost of processing significantly. So, and it could be produced in a fast speed. That's our idea, how to combine this, our solid state uh, battery idea and the uh, non aqueous lithium uh, batteries idea. So now I, I want to give the example how we do this. We have, uh, we have developed the uh, uh, oxide electrolyte coated cancer materials, just to uh, uh, counter this slide. And also uh, we do the in-situ solidification because you cannot coat it or uh, the surface of the uh, cancer or anode particles by the solid state oxide electrolyte or the other electrolyte completely in order to uh, have a uh, electronic conducting path. So in order to further modify, modify the surface of the cancer, so we do the in-situ solidification uh, by several ways. Uh, for, uh, for different cancer that we find, we need to design different uh, precursor and also the uh, initiator. So for example, here, uh, uh, we have published a, a few papers about this. With the cobalt, the lithium cobalt oxide, we use the VC as a precursor. And after polymerization, we get the PVC based uh, electro polymer electrolyte. And then we can fabricate this kind of uh, batteries. With this kind of battery, we use the PO, our solid state battery, PO tech, to, to demonstrate that surface coated cancer can even operate with the high voltage lithium cobalt oxide. You can get the uh, you can get the result from here, you see, with the coating. So even this kind of battery can be cycled over 500 cycles. So this is very encouraging uh, information for us that uh, control the surface of the cancer is very important to extend the uh, operation voltage range of the polymer, uh, uh, including polymer electrolyte or polymer bander. And also the uh, those, uh, uh, solid electrolyte, which has relatively low oxidation voltage, like some sulfide electrolyte. And uh, also here demonstrate another type of the, uh, the, the, the effort. So here you see uh, uh, after this kind of uh, 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 in-situ solidification, PO can operate it uh, properly. With this kind of uh, strategy, you can both improve the chemical and the uh, electrochemical stability. And also you can, you can use the uh, in situ polymerized uh, electrolyte to uh, compatible with the large volume variation of the cancer and anode during the cycling. This is very important. And also we have demonstrated those kind of in situ form the polymer electrolyte is thermal stable. And uh, here we show uh, some other uh, examples to see. Uh, we have published the uh, paper and other uh, groups has also published paper. 
This is the, the first early paper in the 2016 that uh, we uh, we used the LAGP coated uh, separate to uh, to initiate the formation of the SER at anode side. So this is our result. And uh, uh, the very important issue is the thermal stability. Uh, so in, in, uh, we have considered and compiled the thermal stability of the different uh, solid state electrode. With this uh, summary, you can see all kinds of uh, solid electrode which has much higher thermal stability compared to the liquid one. This is very good news, at least, the, uh, although it's well known. And uh, however, so uh, it looks like that oxide electrolyte is most stable and uh, the sulfide than polymer. But the, what's the real case? So you need to, to do the experiment. So we compared uh, four types of oxide electrolyte with the, coupled with lithium to do ARC experiment. So it is not a surprise, but we uh, have the clear data to show, to see, to, to show here that LAGP and LATP, you see, it has a thermal runaway behavior uh, about uh, roughly 300 degrees C. So this means even the oxide electrolyte has been centered about 1000 degrees C, but when it meets with the lithium, when it contact with lithium, it still could cause the thermal runaway. And EFE has calculated the mechanism and we have published paper last year. And uh, fortunately, the LL2 and L0 uh, do not have such kind of thermal runaway behavior. So this is very good news. So that means when we design the uh, solid state batteries, we need to consider, uh, we need to consider which type of the solid electrolyte to be selected for different anode and different cathode. This is uh, the key, key message I want to sh uh, share with the audience. And uh, with the order effort, so we have already know how to deal with the in-situ solidification, the mass production levels, and we have the experience how to produce the uh, fast ion conductor coated cancer to decrease the surface oxidation. And we have the technology to fabricate the ultra thin lithium metaphoria to do the pre dissociation at anode site. And we also developed the solid state electrolyte coated separator to <coughs> Uh, increase the ionic, uh, increase the uh, kinetic performance of the battery and also increase the safety issues. With those combination of the technology, we have tried to develop the battery with the high energy density, like this case, 300 watt hour per kilogram for electric vehicle applications, which can have the uh, uh, acceptable performance like over 1,000 cycle, uh, cycle life, 100% uh, DOD, and also the low temperature performance and the high read performance like 3C, we still achieve 98% capacity retention. And the uh, very important thing is that uh, the safety issues. So with, uh, this is a combination, uh, com comparison, you see the liquid one and the, uh, hybrid solid one. So for hybrid solid one, for this, uh, for this uh, part cell with a large capacity part cells, all the samples have passed the linear penetration. This is very difficult for high energy density cells. And also for the thermal uh, shock testing, you can see it can pass and without a significant voltage decay. And even for this linear penetration, the customer has tested that all the cells has kept the Voltage. If uh, we, when we do the hundred percent SOC linear penetration testing, with this kind of uh, concept, it's possible that we can also fabricate very high energy density lithium and battery when we change the different anode. So in the last year, we do the third party company to attend a battery racing uh, in China, organized by the uh, government uh, by the some uh, government organizations. So we sign our uh, different uh, batteries to the testing that we get a record like high gravimetric energy density over 500 watt hour per kilogram and the volumetric energy density over 18 
100 watt hour per liter. And also the combination of the high volume metric ionic density and the charging rate, and also the combination of both temperature and volumetric and gravimetric and density and high rate. So it looks like uh, with the high, uh, with the combination of this kind of uh, electrolyte uh, strategy, you can design and develop the high energy density batteries, which could have many different applications. So here is our uh, production base in the Beijing, Liyang, and Huzhou cities, that which can uh, deliver the gigawatt hours uh, batteries at the end of this year and next years. So uh, uh, with the uh, experience to uh, fabricate high energy density batteries, we have our consideration what's the roadmap of the future's high energy density. For us, we consider especially, is it possible to fabricate in large scale and how about the cost? And also, uh, and uh, is the material available? So we draw different uh, roadmap like a liquid one and also uh, the uh, hybrid one and also the all solid one. Why all solid one has the higher because our solid one could use the anode contain lithium or at the beginning not contain lithium, but during the second contain lithium, this is a danger. So we hope so the our solid state battery can solve the safety issue of the lithium, but it's not so uh, not so confident. But for hybrid one, we have the demonstration for our solid one, I think it need a long uh, time to to develop, still need a long time. All the time here is, is just a rough estimation, so. And also, I, this is a brief summary that the research on solid battery is a very hot topic in world. So here is the comparison of world and China and cover the new materials and the new battery technologies deal with the uh, solid state battery technologies. And this is a, a map to show the activities in the world to develop the solid state batteries, in, including the uh, North America and Japan, Korea, and China, European. So you see there are a lot, lot, a lot of effort, especially sulfide-based outside battery has been developed very well in Japan and also in USA, the solid state lithium metal battery have been developed in, by many startup companies and also in China has several uh, startup companies and also some other institute and uh, car company and battery company uh, involved in the developing this technology now. So with that, so we show this kind of uh, 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 the roadmap for the energy density improvement with different material combinations. This year, there are four types of the uh, national project will be initiated to support the research on the solid state battery in China. And uh, this is a, a rough expect, uh, expected timeline of the solid state battery for mass production uh, time since uh, this year. And all solid state one could uh, initiate from the uh, 2024, according to our experience. And uh, for developing the R-size the battery and also hybrid one, so we need a combination of the scientist uh, thinking and also business thinking and engineer thinking. Uh, with the team collaboration, we could have the possibility to turn our dream on size the battery into the reality. So the detail we can discuss later. <laughs> Okay, that's the conclusion of that one. So our solid state battery is still difficult and the hybrid one is uh, uh, promising and quite practical for the large production. And uh, so uh, I think the next year, the 350 watt hour per kilogram could be delivered to the market. So thanks for all the uh, 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 collaborations, collaborators and the funding uh, audiences. Okay, thank you. For your attention. All right, Hong, thank you very much for the overview of the research uh, in solid state batteries in China and of course for sharing your latest result. Uh, so now we have some time for questions uh, from our viewers, so maybe uh, let us get started. We talk about the, uh, Hong, you talk about the high level advantage of the hybrid approach, you show some very exciting safety results. Can you tell us some of the trade-offs versus a all solid state battery? What is the price that you have to pay 
in comparison to the all solid state approach? Okay, so uh, in, in principle, uh, if you uh, design a hybrid solid liquid electrolyte, so the key issue is what's the ratio of the liquid in the cells? If the ratio of liquid one is very high or even comparable to the current uh, uh, non aqueous one, so there are no advantage or less advantage for in, improve the safety. So the ratio of the liquid one, uh, the liquid electrolyte should be very, very low. Another issue is you should design new electrolyte, new liquid electrolyte, which has higher uh, high temperature stability and also uh, uh, high, uh, uh, high thermal stability for, for the uh, for use this kind of hybrid uh, concept. So without one, so in order to improve the safety, you see, uh, firstly, we decrease the surface reaction of the cancer by coating the solid state electrolyte. That's an inorganic one. And also the uh, second step do the in-situ polymerization. So we coated a relatively uh, electrochemical stable and thermal stable uh, polymer interface, uh, the CEI layer, and then remain the liquid one and a solid electrolyte one has a higher thermal stability. And we have checked there are no thermal runaway behaviors. So it looks like uh, uh, the hybrid one could design a battery which can uh, operate or even can have the high thermal stability over 200 degrees C. That could be relatively uh, enough for, for, the, uh, for the product because currently the uh, international standard is 130 degrees C. And for the R solid state one, we expected, uh, we use the uh, inorganic, uh, especially inorganic uh, electrolyte, which has a much higher thermal stability. So it could be designed with uh, intrinsic uh, safety, intrinsic safe batteries. That's the, uh, that's the expectations. Uh, but currently, uh, if you do the R solid state battery, you know, we have a lot of challenge. Still, we have a lot of challenge. We still uh, need to design the good materials and also uh, the interface uh, engineer technology and then how to fabricate. So the uh, disadvantage of hybrid one is it, it cannot be regarded as intrinsic uh, safe, uh, systems, but it can be regarded as a, a safety significant improved systems. It can be much better than current uh, world. Okay, that's my idea. <laughs> Home, that's a terrific answer. I think really um, safety also has to have a specification, right? So yeah, yeah. extreme safety may come at an extreme cost. So I think um, this approach of understanding the cost uh, in terms of manufacturing or materials and performance trade-off and the safety implication, I think is a good one. Maybe let me ask you a provocative question. Do you think the hybrid approach is a stopgap solution before the all solid state is realized, or do you think these two technology will coexist um, in the long term? Uh, according to the current status of the companies, some companies to develop the hybrid one, it looks like within the next two years, hybrid one could go could appear in the market. But when you look at the all solid state batteries. So the uh, the raw material supplier have not been have not been developed. Mm -hmm. So we cannot get the large scale uh, supplier for the, for example, sulfide electrolyte and also the oxide electrolyte and uh, our solid state uh, electrolyte membrane. Those materials are not available in the market, and still uh, uh, to be developed is still not uh, satisfied for the real batteries. So. Uh, at the beginning, I think maybe uh, two or three years or even five years early than the uh, large production of all solid state lithium batteries. But <clears throat> gradually, if, if really the ASRB can be realized and can have the significant safety issues. So in some market, the safety is the top one, of course, top one requirement. So for those uh, at the beginning, maybe some expensive niche market could accept the outside state lithium battery and then follow the uh, large market like EV and uh, stationary applications. And also you have to consider how to decrease the cost of outside state lithium battery. Currently, there are no, uh, uh, there are no uh, reliable uh, solutions that the ASRB is very cheaper. <laughs> Now that's a great point. Uh, maybe let's get a high level question before we go down to the specific details and the technical question. 
So um, Hong, you show some very nice photos of uh, production equipment. Uh, can you discuss a little bit of the scaling up challenges for the hybrid battery that is uh, unique to it, say compared to a traditional liquid battery? What makes the production scaling up challenging for this technology? Uh, according to our experience, so we do not uh, feel significant uh, challenge. So we will use most of the available uh, uh, equipment and machines. But of course, we need some new machines, like uh, we need to develop the low cost pre uh, machine to do the electric levered pre -lisation. But this is depending on the development of pre the silicon materials. If the, in the material level, pre can be can be performed, then the requirement on the pre technology on the electro the lever could be not so uh, serious. But uh, we have the experience to do the pre technology on uh, electro lever. So it's really kind of helpful to extend the cycle life and also decrease the internal resistance and even increase the safety issue. So this, you have to de design the new machines. Uh, of course, the, some company have developed for a long time, but the key issue is cost, how to decrease the cost of this kind of machine and the processing technology. And then secondly is uh, when you do the in-situ uh, certification, you need to change the formation precisely. And also you could control the uh, lot of issues. So you, you have to change the uh, uh, pr procedures of this kind of machine and also change some uh, design. So those two uh, machines have, have been, uh, could be changed. But for a long, uh, long period uh, viewpoint, so uh, if the SEI and the CI have been already grouped during the fabrication instead of uh, currently standard formation, so the formation processing will be changed significantly. This is a big change so, uh, and also could decrease the cost. Thank you, Han. So let me get into some technical questions we have received here. Uh, so you have shown some very impressive performance result in terms of cycle life. How about the calendar life? Does this in-situ solidification uh, also improve the calendar life of the batteries as well compared to liquid? So uh, the calendar life uh, is mainly limited the, at high temperature. In, in some case, high temperature, dissolution of transition matters, and also the dissolution of the organic component in SEI at anode side, and also of course, the, uh, gradually uh, deformation and the uh, deconstruction of the structure of the cathode and anode. So if you use the hybrid electrolyte, which can operate at high temperature and also nearly uh, it already uh, formed a solid electrolyte on the surface of anode particle and cathode particle. So it's hard now to have the further side, continuous side reactions. So the, at, at, at high temperature, we have the published paper the battery can be operated at 80 degrees C. Normally 80 degrees C is uh, not uh, possible for the non-aqueous lithium batteries. So with the, with the introduction of the new hybrid concept, so the battery can operate at the room temperature, relatively low temperature, and also very important high temperature. So it's not only increased the uh, calendar life, but also increased the uh, high temperature cycle, cycle life. So this is very important and advantage of the hybrid uh, uh, cell com compared to the liquid one. So with this uh, property, we need to consider to design the modular or pack in a new way. So to decrease the cooling system or to, uh, to even free of, cooling, uh, free of uh, water cooling systems. Thank you, Han. Um, a related question was on the rate performance. So you should also show some very impressive high rate charging performance of the hybrid battery. Um, is the in-situ solidification also preventing lithium plating as well? Uh, OK. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a really good question. So this is really depending on the uh, energy density and also, uh, the, I mean, the uh, energy density of achieved energy density and also depending on the NP ratio and also the anode side. So if you want to avoid the uh, uh, formation of the lithium dendrite completely, you need to have the large NP ratios and the anode side can contain lithium in the lattice or in the uh, microporous, at least uh, 
uh, with this idea. And if you have the uh, uh, relatively uh, not so uh, aggressive design, is, uh, or, 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 excuse me, if you want to have aggressive design with very high energy density, that, uh, that in the end side, the lithium has to appear during the cycling. So with that, we, you can see we use the uh, organic electrolyte coated uh, separate, which have the two advantages. One is to block the penetration of the lithium dendrite, uh, also to surprise the formation of the lithium dendrite. And then uh, when the lithium wants to, when the lithium dendrite uh, uh, penetrate through the first uh, contact layer, so it will react with the lithium. You know, we use the active oxide elect uh, electrolyte coating, not uh, uh, inactive one. So most of people de develop the garnet uh, type. So we use the LATP type. It's a really different idea. So with the LATP design, you will react with lithium. So at the beginning, the LATP will uh, be covered by the ICI. But when the lithium come, it's a particle, uh, multi-layer multi -layer particle uh, coating. So the lithium cannot penetrate through this, uh, this special design separate. That's our uh, advantage of this design. And uh, we have tested the life and also this kind of possibility for the uh, formation of the lithium dendrite or, or the, even the depletion of the lithium. So it seems uh, quite good. Terrific. Uh, Han, I'm, I'm afraid we don't have more time for questions. Uh, there are a number of other questions, um, so I apologize. I, I'm not able to go over them. Uh, Han, thank you again for sharing these really exciting results. And uh, yeah, we're very much looking forward to seeing uh, more of these results and perhaps in the commercial setting as well. Thank you. Han. Okay, thank you. Thank you for hosting. Terrific, terrific. Uh, well, I'm also now delighted to introduce our second speaker. So we just heard from Professor Han Li uh, from China. And now we will hear from Professor Kisuk Khan in South Korea. So uh, Kisuk is a professor in the Department of Material Science Engineering at Seoul National University. And he has been uh, doing really breakthrough work in material chemistry uh, on battery materials and other uh, energy technologies uh, for more than 20 years. And he's contributed not only from discovery of new materials and experimental methods, but also in the computational side as well for predicting and understanding new materials. And uh, he's also uh, uh, has done great deal of service uh, to the society and the communities. Uh, for example, uh, he was recently elected on the board of directors for the Materials Research Society. Uh, so I'm glad I see the person who I voted won. So congratulations, Kizuk. Thank you for serving the community. Uh, and he's also the editor of the Journal of Materials Chemistry as well uh, at the Royal Society of Chemistry. And uh, Kisuk today uh, is going to focus on a very important aspect, uh, which is developing new uh, cathodes for uh, various uh, battery chemistry, lithium and sodium. And uh, Kisuk, we're very much looking for your talk. And then uh, please go ahead. Hey, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, I'm very happy uh, to be part of this uh, uh, Storage X uh, symposium. I hope that uh, this is going to be a good opportunity uh, for us to communicate regarding the state of the art uh, lithium battery technology. Uh, the title of my talk today uh, is New Battery Chemistry from Conventional Layered Cathode Materials for Advanced uh, Lithium Ion Batteries. Uh, in this presentation, I will talk about how we can take a full advantage of uh, the layered trench metal oxides cathode, which has been the dominant cathode materials for uh, the current lithium ion batteries. Uh, as we know, the current lithium, uh, current li limitation uh, in achieving a higher energy density battery actually lies in how we can gain more lithium and electron from the electrode without jeopardizing stability of the electrode uh, materials. So in this respect, uh, I will discuss about our new findings on the layered trench metal oxide when more lithium ions are stored by the additional redox reaction to the oxygen redox activity, which is so-called the lithium beach or lithium excess layer of the trench metal oxides. I probably saw one slide from the Professor Hongli's uh, talk about the, uh, uh, the roadmap of the future uh, for the higher energy density batteries. 
So I will show that the uh, lithium intercalation mechanisms are significantly different in these materials. And this is uh, correlated with uh, various stability uh, problems of these materials. And uh, based on this understanding, we develop a new layer uh, lithium excess uh, transient metal oxides that can circumvent uh, the problem uh, which we presented today. Uh, since I'm the first speaker from this uh, Korea in the storage X uh, one, uh, let me uh, let me have a few uh, words on, on the situation in Korea and how we uh, do a battery research here. Uh, with respect to battery research and development, uh, Korea has a very good balance among uh, the industry, academia, and the government strategic uh, support. Uh, the battery research funding has increased steadily by average uh, annual 4.3% for the past 10 years, which actually fostered the basic research activity in the academia. Uh, and uh, through the uh, active collaboration uh, with the battery manufacturers, uh, Korean universities like uh, Seoul National University, I, I, I mean, uh, uh, can provide the battery experts uh, who have the balanced view of the fundamental battery science and the need from uh, the industry. So among the top seven uh, electric vehicle battery manufacturers in the world, uh, Korea has uh, three major companies uh, like uh, LG Chemistry. Uh, now it has, a name, has changed the name as Energy, uh, LG Energy Solutions, uh, Samsung SDI, and uh, SK Innovation, which occupy more than 30% of the world market share. So we are looking uh, uh, very positive. So uh, let me I'll come back to the, uh, the science again. Uh, just for recap, uh, lithium ion batteries are composed of three major components, uh, cathode, uh, anode, and the electrolyte. And uh, with the charge and discharge of the battery, lithium ions are extracted from the one electrode and reinserted to the other. And this is actually, this is actually the crystal structure of the layer of transient metal oxide. And then one thing that needs to be reminded uh, is that in the cathode side, which requires high redox potential, the redox reaction relies on the oxidation and reduction of transient metal, which allows the electron storage. And the, tra the transient metal uh, redox exhibits generally high potential and the high reversibility. And this is why most of the cathode materials uh, contain transient metals in it, such as lithium cobalt oxide, NCM, LFP, and then LMO, et cetera. One of the interesting findings in recent years uh, was that not only the transient metal, but also uh, the oxygen in these materials uh, can participate in the overall redox reaction at certain circumstances, offering additional room for the capacity. Uh, in the conventional cathode, the capacity is uh, provided by the redox of transient metal, and the typical capacity is around 140 to about 200 milliampere gram at the best. But when the anionic redox is additionally allowed, we have more sites for the electron storage, uh, simply speaking. Uh, therefore, the capacity can be much more enhanced. So in a very simple picture, it is a transition from these redox reactions solely occurring at the transient metal uh, to this cumulative redox reaction both from transient metal and the oxygen so that we can store more lithium and more electron. There have been heated discussion on what can make this anion redox reaction possible and how, we, how, how these can be uh, stabilized. I'm not gonna go into the uh, details of this discussion, but one of the consensus and the simple explanation was that when the local environment of oxygen in the layer of the structure, uh, such as uh, three transient metal above and the three lithium ions below in the layer of the structure, uh, then uh, the, when this local uh, environment shifts from this in conventional layer of the structure to this uh, with additional lithium in its surrounding, in the lithium excess material, and it's going to happen. So this particular oxygen uh, generates a new state in the density of states and allows additional and accessible capacity. So this kind of local oxygen environment is typically made in, of course, lithium excess material, which 
has some of the lithium occupancy in this transition metal. And then as you can see here, uh, in the conventional layered structure, they, they all, uh, the transition metals all occupied by transition metal here, but some of the lithiums are occupying here. So the, those kind of oxygen, which has lithium, oxygen, lithium bonding is going to be produced in this particular uh, material group. Despite this promise for a higher energy density uh, due to additional anion redox reaction in this uh, lithium excess material, there have been uh, several chronicle problems that need to be resolved. And one of them was uh, the gradual uh, voltage decay, which is typically observed when the lithium excess material is cycled as cathode multiple times here. It suffers from uh, the user capacity fading, uh, capacity fading, but also the voltage fading, uh, vol voltage fading over cycles. Uh, considering the energy density is the product of the voltage and the capacity, the decay of both values uh, make the energy density decay double times. So regarding the voltage decay problem, our group uh, have uh, previously reported that it is actually correlated with the local phase transition from this layer of the structure to the disordered or uh, spinner-like structure like this. And we suspected that it might cause the unwanted change in the redox reaction. So inspired by this uh, previous finding, uh, we hypothesized that the decay of the voltage is partly induced by the structural transition and the activation of the low potential redox reactions such as manganese. So taking one of the representative lithium excess material, lithium 1.2, nickel 0.2, manganese 0 0.602, which has about 20% of lithium occupying the transient metal layer, therefore the anion redox reaction is supposed to be possible. Uh, we envision that the redox reaction is going to take place like this. So first, during the charge, when lithium is extracted, the electrons are extracted from the nickel cation redox reaction, contributing about 0.4 electrons, while remaining 0.8 lithium ions are deintercalated with the oxygen oxidation. So, in an ideal reverse, uh, ideally reversible situation, the discharge reaction is going to be exactly the opposite uh, reaction. On the other hand, if there is a loss of oxygen uh, during the oxygen reaction, uh, during the charge, oxygen states will be partially lost so that during the discharge reaction, some of the originally unoccupied state like manganese will participate in the reaction. And it is well known that the uh, manganese 3 plus and 4 plus redox reaction is low in the potential and typically triggers the formation of the spinel-like structure. So if this is the case, uh, we thought that we can simply detour this problem by introducing additional uh, uh, empty state of high redox transient metal in the density of states. For example, if we increase the nickel contents from 0.2 to about 0.4 like this, then the overall oxidation state of nickel becomes three plus, and it will generate the empty state of nickel two plus just uh, below the manganese uh, states. And even when there is a loss of the oxygen during the charge, and some of the unoccupied, uh, the level uh, from nickel is going to be occupied uh, due to this, uh, the, uh, the alignment of states, and then it will prevent the manganese redox uh, participation. And we call this as a redox buffer. So having this simple uh, idea in mind, uh, we designed uh, three samples with slightly different composition of nickel uh, and manganese having same amount of lithium excess in the layer structure. The X-ray diffraction and the neutron diffraction confirmed that all the three samples were successfully synthesized in the layer of the structure and uh, proof of X-ray absorption spectroscopy also verified the samples had uh, the oxidation states of the transient metals as we intended like this. 
interestingly, we find that the, uh, the simple tuning actually works uh, good in suppressing the voltage decay. Uh, as you can see here, the original sample uh, shows gradual uh, decay of the voltage with the cycles and is more clearly displayed in the differential curves here. But as we add more redox buffer and nickel so that we can make the nickel fuel plus more and more, the voltage decay behavior is significantly uh, mitigated. And after the cycles, we analyzed the samples to see how the formation of disordered or spinner-like structures were uh, affected by the presence of the redox buffer. And these experiments uh, confirmed that the uh, phase transition was uh, also substantially inhibited uh, with the sample with a redox buffer in here. Uh, finally, we wanted to verify uh, whether this redox buffer concept really worked in suppressing the voltage decay. So the investigation of oxidation states of each sample uh, clearly shows that the original sample with the manganese 4 plus and nickel 2 plus produces mainly manganese 3 plus after the multiple cycles. And then we know that uh, this actually caused the uh, decay of the voltage. On the other hand, uh, the sample with the redox buffer showed that even after the cycles, manganese 3 plus is not produced, is that nickel was reduced uh, from three plus two, two plus two compensate for any kind of changes in the structure serving as the redox buffer. So it clearly demonstrates that a simple change in the composition in the next generation lithium excess layered material can actually result in the suppressing the voltage uh, decay, uh, this chronical problem of these material. Uh, so we are happy uh, to solve this problem. And it seemed that uh, this new material would be a good high energy uh, density lecture. But it was not the end of the story. And then we found out that uh, unfortunately there are some other problem actually emerging with this new material. It showed a comparatively lower power capability. Uh, when it operates uh, at slow charging rate, like C over 20, which corresponds to about 20 hours of charging time, it was okay. But when it's charged at a practically important rate like a 1C, which is about one hour charging time, uh, its capacity, uh, 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 the 2440 is our sample, uh, is uh, notably lower than the usual lithium excess uh, material. And uh, we found that this low, low power capability problem is not from charging process, but interestingly from the discharge process. As we can see here, when we increase the current density uh, during the charge from C over 20 to 1C, the reduction of the capacity is not so notable, it's not significant. And on the other hand, when the same experiment was conducted in the discharge, the capacity reduction is much more appreciable. And it is a very interesting behavior and has not been observed in a conventional uh, layered electrode material where the interpolation and the intercalation are regarded as the symmetrically opposite reaction. So the behavior should be similar. And we also could confirm uh, this symmetric behavior of sluggish discharge and fast charging reaction here. First, we discharge the electrode until the normal voltage cutoff and force the further intercalation to achieve about 250 million gram. And it naturally exhibits a voltage plateau lower than two volts, which is not usually observed in conventional operation voltage, but uh, is uh, attributable to the uh, uh, tetrahedral lithium occupation uh, in the layer structure. Uh, surprisingly, during the charging reaction at the same current density and the same temperature, this low voltage plateau was absent and the normal charging curve was observed, which indicate that all the lithiums were successfully deintercalated from the octahedral side. So it was integrated to the tetrahedral side because of the sluggish kinetics, but suddenly it comes from the octahedral side exhibiting the low normal voltage charging uh, curve. Intrigued by this unexpected observation, uh, we repeated uh, the experiment at a series of other temperatures from 10 degrees C to about 60 degrees C, and it confirmed that it is reproducible. And more interestingly, 
uh, it shows that the discharge reaction is much more temperature dependent than the charging reaction. If you look at the low voltage plateau here, uh, it is the longest at 10 degrees C, but it almost disappears at 60 degrees C where the normal discharge curve is recovered at this 60 degrees C. And it strongly supports that the discharge reaction is symmetrically more sluggish than the discharging reaction. From the series of the investigations, we found that the, uh, this asymmetric behavior is coupled with the outer plane transition metal migration in the layered structure. So this is the atomistic picture of the layered structure where the bright spots are the trench metal and the dark layers are lithium layers. And at 60 degrees C, it was found that with charging, a significant amount of trench metal ions migrate to the lithium layer, uh, which is supposed to be completely black, but the, uh, the presence of this uh, bright spot means that trench metal are occupying this layer. But they reversibly migrate back to the original layer during after the discharge, recovering the perfect layer structure. On the other hand, when operated at room temperature, the trench metal ions migrate to lithium layer upon charge, but do not completely come back with the discharge with the T2 volt. Here, you see that a substantial amount of trench metal ions remain in the lithium layer, uh, as you can see here. But interestingly, when we first uh, the lithium intercalation up to 220, uh, 250 milliampere gram, those trench metals are no longer observable in the lithium layer, indicating the recovery of the layered structure. So there is a clear correlation between the trench metal presence in the lithium layer and the voltage curve. And the, the series of the pictures imply that the lithium intercalation and the deintercalation in this lithium excess layered material is, uh, is, uh, is, is moving together, is uh, strongly coupled with the trench metal migration. So according to these observations, uh, we propose a new lithium intercalation uh, and the intercalation mechanism coupled with the trench metal migration in the layer, layer structure. First, during the delithiation, the trench metal can easily pop up. Okay, so this is, these are the original trench metal layer and these are the original lithium layer. With the charging, the delithiation of lithium, this trench metal can easily pop up to the vacant lithium layer. And the trench metal should migrate back to the trench metal size during the real lithiation for normal discharge reaction. But unfortunately, some of the trench metal in the lithium layer uh, that has migrated can also migrate in the vacant lithium layer, hopping farther from the original site. And if it happens, it very much complicates the path backward uh, during the, uh, uh, the relitiation and requires longer migration plan. So, litiation, delitiation process and delitiation process can be uh, symmetrically different. So compared with the simple hopping up of the trench of metal during the charge, the complicated and longer path of trench of metal during discharge is believed to result in the particularly sluggish discharge reaction because those coming lithium, coming incoming lithium have to interact and then push these trench of metals back to this. This asymmetric lithium fusion is quite contrary uh, to the conventional belief on the lithium intercalation and deintercalation mechanisms. In the classical model of intercalation, the lithium insertion and deinsertion process should be identical and the mo only mobile ions and the lithium ions. And uh, in this inter conventional intercalation model, diffusion model, only slight structural expansion and contraction were conceived. Uh, uh, and then uh, this was the model uh, and then that off, uh, offered uh, that, uh, uh, that had been perceived uh, for many years. And uh, the asymmetric kinetic properties about, uh, on this, under this model uh, cannot be explained. 
But our new lithium diffusion model, as illustrated in this uh, slide, reveals that uh, lithium is not the only mobile ion, and their motion is coupled with the transient metal migration, and this involves reversible but asymmetric uh, transient metal migration, which elucidates our experimental findings. So one thing that should be noted uh, is that transient metal migration into lithium layer is actually thermodynamically favorable at, is at extremely uh, at low lithium uh, stoichiometry and is an almost unavoidable phenomenon during the charge process. When the lithium stoichiometry is low, and of course, uh, the Roxxon uh, phase or spinel phase are the thermodynamically uh, more stable phases according to the uh, calculations and also uh, from thermodynamic uh, the data. And once this transient metal in the lithium layer is uh, distracted, much longer migration path awaits during discharge. This actually results in two consequences in lithium excess material. One, with the redox buffer, as we have seen so far, the sluggish kinetics and low capacity. On the other hand, for the material without the redox buffer, uh, the conventional one, which induces probably manganese three plus ions, this transient metal migration would trigger the massive phase transition of the material to spinner-like phase, causing the significant voltage phase. Then how do we resolve this? Uh, if the transient metal migration uh, to the lithium layer is almost inevitable because of the thermodynamics, we thought that the substantive key to minimize this negative effect is to streamline the structure so that transient metal migration only occurs at this path, so it comes up, but it doesn't distract, but it comes back. So that, uh, I mean, so the transient metal migration occurs only at this path and inhibit other paths uh, like this uh, in plane migrations in the lithium layer. And uh, this will block, if we can uh, lock here, uh, then uh, the further migration of transient metal is going to be uh, inhibited. So then how do we do that? Then how do we actually ensure the transient metals do not go astray in the vacant lithium layer and readily come back to its original site when lithiums are uh, reintercalated? So we believe that we can control this transient metal migration by altering the stacking sequences of layer of the structure from the conventional O3 structure where A, B, C, A, B, C stacking to O2 structure with A, B, C, B, A. So it seems like the same layer of structure, uh, uh, but the oxygen stackings are different so that the local transient metal uh, environments are quite different. So if you look at a little bit uh, closely at the local environment during the transient metal migration in these two different layers of structure, they are substantially different. In the conventional O3 structure, the transient metal uh, hops to the lithium layer via this intermediate site and jumps to the nearest octahedral site. And these octahedral sites, these are the lithium layer, these are transient metal layer. And these octahedral sites are relatively stable. Uh, and therefore, uh, this process can readily occur. On the other hand, in O2 structure, this transient metal can go to the intermediate site but when this hops to the nearest octahedral site, then this octahedral site is strongly repulsed by the transient metal underneath. The reason why there is a transient metal underneath this octahedral site is because of the different oxygen stacking, which allows the occupation of transient metal right here. So this strong repulsion uh, should prohibit the migration of transient metal to this so that the transient metal should migrate back to its intermediate tetrahedral site, so it's locked here. So this difference in the stability of the octahedral site arises from, of course, different stacking sequences of OT and O3 layer structure. So this argument is to be supported by our first principles calculations on each side. As we can see in the graph showing the relative side energy of transient metal here, it's observed that uh, treasure metal in the original O3 structure 
can easily go to the intermediate site and finally ends up the octahedra site with a negative energy slope. On the other hand, in the O2 structure, the transition metal can hop into the intermediate site, but it cannot further migrate to the neighboring octahedral site because of its high energy barrier. So inspired by this uh, idea and the theoretical calculations, uh, we decided to synthesize the O2 lithium excess layered structure. But unfortunately, uh, uh, we could not obtain the phase using the conventional solid state reaction because it's not uh, the thermodynamic state of phase at high temperature is O3. So we had to go through the indirect method. So it has been well known that this kind of uh, uh, O2 structure can be derived from the P2 type structure. And these P2 type structures are easily synthesizable at high temperature by the sodium phase. Uh, 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 sodium phase uh, formations. So we prepared this sodium version of the uh, lithium excess in P2 layer the structure and ion exchange the sodium, the lithium uh, through the soft chemical method and then uh, attempted to obtain this auto structure. So the, uh, this, these are show, uh, this shows the, uh, the final products. Uh, as you can see here, the X-ray diffraction patterns on the left, uh, left on the left confirmed that we successfully obtained the uh, O2 type layered lithium excess material uh, from this P2 type of sodium phase. And then the particles uh, were around a few micron uh, sizes as we can see from the SEM picture. Through our surprise, this shows that uh, we found that this O2 structure is very effective uh, in retaining the energy density. Uh, this figure uh, presents the first and second charge and discharge curves of O2 layered material, which can deliver a capacity more than 230 milliampere gram. And uh, the voltage profile of the discharge was almost unchanged over 40 cycles without the decrease of the voltage, indicating the success of our strategy. The comparison of uh, comparison with the conventional O3 type structure sample, uh, as we can see here, they show uh, the gradual decay of the voltage over 40 cycles. Uh, but we can see that our sample shows steady voltage uh, at, uh, at high voltage here. And because of the suppressed voltage decay, uh, the retention of the practical energy density of O2 uh, was uh, very well retained. Uh, it is about more about 600 watt per kilogram after 40 cycles, which is superior to that of the O3 type structure. Uh, we found that uh, this stability in the voltage and the energy density is attributable uh, to the reversible and the asymmet uh, and symmetric transition metal migration during charge and discharge. And as we can see here, after the charging, the transition metals are visible in the lithium layer, but they disappear completely upon the discharge, indicating the reversible migration of transient metal back to its old, old original one when the lithium is come, coming back. And this reversible migration of transient metals also inhibit the unnecessary formation of the disordered or spinal-like domains in the structure, as can be seen from these Raman uh, spectroscopy. Moreover, uh, the structure stability uh, could be maintained even after the long-term cycles which do not show any signatures of uh, disordered or uh, the spinal-like formations. So in summary, uh, uh, we show that uh, there are still uh, such interesting uh, new chemistry in the layered structure uh, which uh, uh, have been uh, studied over uh, uh, several decades. Uh, and uh, it our findings uh, on the lithium excess material requires rewriting of the classical lithium diffusion or intercalation model. So we have to think about again. And the proper structure redesigning of uh, the layer of the structure can offer uh, the stable and higher energy density for advanced uh, lithium ion battery. 
Uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my crew members, uh, and then these uh, works were pre uh, primarily done by Dongun uh, Um and uh, Byung Kim, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Gyu Jin Gu, who is in now in our Argo National Laboratory. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Kisu, thank you very much for sharing the science of cathodes, uh, a topic that's very uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, so thank you for sharing. Let me also begin with a maybe a high level question. Um, the O2 structure you show has a very exciting performance. Um, but if I remember, you also concluded in that paper that uh, practical scaling up of this um, ion exchange could be challenging. Um, can you maybe give us some insights into what it would take to do ion exchange at scale for cathodes? Okay, so the ideal uh, synthetic route is going to be uh, the one by the solid state reaction as we have been doing for making conventional lithium cobalt oxide or NCM, just uh, mixing precursors of lithium and the transition metal and by having different ratio and it heated up and it tends up with our structure. But unfortunately, uh, the thermodynamically stable structure, I mean, the, uh, the phase uh, of this composition of lithium excess is O3 type layer structure. And O2 type is the kind of metastable uh, structure. Uh, but the fact that it is metastable structure doesn't necessarily mean, mean that we cannot synthesize in a mass scale of way. Uh, in our paper or in our presentation, we we focused on our proof of concept. We wanted to like verify that this kind of altering of stackings and the regulating the transient metal migration in the layer structure is going to be effectively uh, solve or mitigate the problems that we encounter in the lithium excess material. And that's why we did the focus on more on the synthetic science. But I think there will be uh, some uh, the pathway that we can produce this O2 structure in a more scalable and most, uh, more cost-effective way. Especially, uh, there is one more step that have been added here. We synthesize the sodium phase just like uh, in high solid state reaction, high temperature, just like we do in NCM. But we put in uh, the bath of lithium, uh, and then we ion exchange about 280 degrees C. So this is not like high temperature, but it requires additional process and then also we have to do the washing and drying steps like that but if we can find out the way we can do uh, this additional process in a more cost effective way it's going to be more interesting or if we can find out some uh, way that we can do the high temperature synthetic method by having altering the atmosphere so that these uh, metastable states slightly metastable states appear even at the high temperature state, then it's going to be uh, very, very uh, good and uh, fortunate uh, situation, scenario. Okay, so I think that's a really great point. Um, and maybe a related question is the stability of this metastable O2 structure. Um, how persistent is it? Um, if you were to able to cycle the battery, say for 1500 cycles or 10 years, do you expect um, the O2 to be persistent uh, over that time scale? I, I think so. Uh, it is because, you know, thermodynamically, I mean, we know that the all the nature wants to go to the, uh, you know, very low energetic states. Okay, but the matter, practical, uh, the life, in the practical situation is that how high the barrier is going to be. Okay, how high is going to barrier be? So let me let me give you one example. Lithium cobalt oxide uh, in itself is thermodynamically stable. But when we delitiate so that we can take some of the lithium, so that, for example, if it becomes lithium 0.9 cobalt oxide, the thermodynamically stable phase is not a layer structure. The thermodynamically stable phase is a phase segregation between full lithium cobalt oxide and some spinel or the rock salt phase. But still, we can operate more than 200 cycles or 300 cycles, okay? It is because uh, the thermodynamic drive force and also the barrier is not sufficient to make this uh, transition occurs. Coming back to our material, so then 
we have a, a view that O3 structure is more stable than O2 structure. Then what's going to be the determinant barrier to phase transform to O3 structure over multiple cycles? If you look at those two structures, you can see that O2 structure cannot slide into the O3. By having uh, the metal oxygen bond breaking, you can only obtain O3 structure. So O3 and O1 are compatible with this sliding, and then it can easily transform from one to the other without breaking the traditional metal and oxygen bonding. But on the other hand, O2 and O3 are completely different stacking, and they are different family. So that if we want to, if if the uh, if uh, if we want to transform uh, the O2 to O3 structure, the bond breaking, major bond breaking, has to occur. And it will require very high energy, uh, uh, the barrier. So I'm quite sure that uh, this phase transformation uh, to the more stable O3 structure is not going to easily happen during uh, the operation time of our interest. Thank you, Kisuk. Maybe let me also follow up with a question here. You know, in my encountering of various roadmaps and reports about the next generation batteries, uh, cathodes and so forth, it's not often you see um, the lithium excess material on the roadmap, although you know very well that it's been highly investigated in academia. Um, what is um, the challenge here that prevents the lithium rich material to be on the roadmap, say, uh, in addition to the nickel rich material? What's the consideration uh, industry has in mind right now in terms of the roadmap? Okay, so uh, with respect to the uh, uh, the uh, the cost and the the feasibility of the technical extension, uh, the nickel rich nickel high nickel one is going to be the immediate future. Okay, so we have uh, we had the uh, one third one third one third NCM and. 622, 811, and now nickel composition goes to about 90%. And we know that by having this nickel, uh, there are demerits like uh, stability and uh, like this one, but clear merits is the higher energy density. And then uh, the technology developments has found out how we can manage the safety issues. That's why energy density wise, we have gone to the high nickel. But I think the end is now right here. What happens, we have a nickel 0.95 and 0.98. What's going to be the next? I think uh, the high nickel one is going to become very, very soon, okay? And uh, we have to look for other chemistry, okay? Then what's going to be the one? As I said in the uh, beginning of my talk, we have to change the paradigm uh, thinking. Uh, we have focused on transition metal redox reaction. But the anion redox reaction can offer additional capacity without compensating for the redox reaction in the transient metal. And there are very much high technical barrier in adding this additional anion redox reaction to this conventional redox reaction. Okay? With respect to the only conventional redox reaction from the transient metal, we can go to up to 0.98 or 0.999, whatever. But the next thing then we have to add should be the anion redox reaction. And the most practically feasible way to utilize this anion redox reaction, I believe, is uh, in the layered structure is a lithium excess or lithium rich chemistry. And practically, uh, uh, in the company, I have worked with uh, many companies so far uh, here, uh, the, the one to one comparisons between high nickel and this uh, lithium rich uh, one right now uh, is. Uh, it, I mean, comparison is not valid. I mean, because high nickel one still shows a very high energy density and the lithium rich one does not show the capacity that is expected because of the voltage decay. And one of the problem, most important problem was voltage decay and which actually decreased the energy density to the level to the high energy, high nickel ones. That's why people were less interested and people from the industry were less interested in here. But we, by having this one breakthrough by one breakthrough, I think now we can solve the voltage problem and solve other gas evolution problems. Then 
there are more rules here uh, for the oxygen redox reaction. So I think in the academia side, we have to uh, further or continue to work on this anion redox reaction. Okay, so I fully agree, maybe in a self-serving way as well. So thank you very much for those comments. Maybe for my last question, uh, let me also be provocative as well. So this field of uh, high valent redox mechanism really has received a lot of attention over the past uh, 10 years. And you know, in your presentation, you really highlighted this importance of the out-of-plane transition metal migration. Uh, but I would say recently in the past couple of years, there's also been increased reports on the importance of in-plane migration as well. Could you give us some insight in how your mechanism could be relevant to the in-plane migration? Okay. Um, okay, so that's the paper that we submitted. <laughs> the relation between in-plane disordering and the out-of-plane disordering. Uh, it's, uh, it's under review, <laughs> under revision. So uh, I have to be a little bit more careful. But our recent finding is that in-plane disordering and out-of-plane disordering are quite coupled with each other, okay? Our understanding, preliminary understanding, I cannot disclose fully here, but the uh, in-plane disordering, when those are like, so the in lithium excess material, uh, the in-plane uh, migration of transient metal in the transient metal layer is possible. It is because unlike the uh, conventional layer of the structure, which has a full occupation of transient metal, now you have a vacant site because some of the lithium are occupying the transient metal layer and those lithiums are supposed to be extracted or go to the lithium layer in certain circumstances. So those vacancy mediated uh, migration of transient metal in the transient metal is going to be possible, okay? So when this in-plane disordering or migration transient metal occurs, then some of the specific oxygen environments are actually occurred. So sometimes oxygen, oxygen dimer, uh, or some of the un, uh, un, uh, unstable oxygen environment is going to be caused by the transient metal migration. And because of some of the vacant uh, situation lithium, so some of the, this oxygen is highly reactive. So these causes, these promotes some neighboring transient metal pop up to the Lithium layer so that it can stabilize, it can be stabilized itself. So, this in plane disordering and out of disordering is actually coupled. So, some of the material which has been reported that there are no out of plane disordering, but there are some voltage decay is coming from this in plane disordering. And afterwards, we found that some disordering uh, out of disorder actually occurred if you look at very tough. Great, I look forward to seeing that work. All right, um, so in this symposium, we typically have a spirited discussion afterwards. So I have the job of asking some interesting questions to get the discussion going. Uh, maybe let me just get started by asking this question about road mapping. And recently, there's been some very interesting movements in the road mapping I would like to get your thoughts on. Um, so there was some recent announcements from Chinese um, battery developer who really saw the benefits of improving the anode. For example, by using high silicon um, content and so forth. And now we're seeing this opposite trend where then the cathode is being replaced with something that is lower energy density. So I wanted to get both of your thoughts on this unusual trend where anode is really getting higher energy density and we are now seeing trends in which the cathode are being replaced with lower energy density. For example, one pairing is silicon rich and lithium iron phosphate, which together can still achieve pretty interesting energy density. So. Uh, since both of you work actively on the cathodes and the solid electrolyte and uh, anode, I wanted to get your thoughts on this trend we're seeing uh, coming from uh, some uh, developers. Uh, Hong, do you want to maybe uh, have a comment on this first? Uh, okay, so uh, thanks also for Kisuk's very <laughs> excellent talk. I learned a lot. So for these questions is 
the safety issue is the key issue. Yes, for some, uh, for the EV applications, safety is the top one concern. If you, uh, from many uh, uh, experience, so lithium ion phosphate is really uh, very stable at uh, abuse applications. So now if we can see the RFP is the most safe tether, then is it possible to increase the energy density of the cell? Then, so the combination of silicon uh, with the RFP become a, a new design like uh, proposed uh, uh, recently by Gaussian company. Uh, but silicon, you know, it has a very poor cycle life, the relatively poor cycle life, but RFP can have a cycle life over 10,000 cycles. So the combination of this kind of uh, design may not uh, used for stationary application, but could be conceived for the EV application compared to the, if you couple the carbon with the uh, RFP. Uh, when you introduce the high silicon uh, contained, you have co to consider how to deal with the volume uh, expansion and contraction. So then the predisation has to be introduced also. So the total combination of those technology uh, still need to consider the cost issue. And another issue is, so uh, one tendency is to, as mentioned by uh, Kisu, is the high nickel, uh, there are a lot of effort that also the low nickel uh, uh, content, uh, but charge to high voltage is another possibility. So some company and also many researchers are trying to understand for uh, uh, like five to three type, typical five to three type or six uh, one three or six two two. So if we charge to 4.4 volt to get the same capacity as high nickel, so what's the, uh, which one is most safe? So. Uh, safe because it's the as I mentioned is first concern. So for that kind of uh, consideration, so the low nickel, low nickel and the low energy density cancer have been conceived because also the uh, uh, because also the improvement of anode size. So if you change the high capacity anode and you use the uh, low uh, nickel, so you can still increase the energy density compared to previous one and get the high safe. So that's the uh, penalty. But for long term, so uh, so if you check the history of the least one batteries, the increased energy density is of course the always the tendency. So how to increase the energy density to get the balance of other performance? I really agree with the Kisuk's uh, consideration that after high nickel, what happens? So you have to consider the the, the next one. So I really agree that the nickel uh, lithium rich should be the first choice compared to other, like a sulfur or air battery, lithium air battery, lithium sulfur battery, compared to lithium air and lithium sulfur, lithium rich is more uh, uh, practical. And uh, you need to consider how to design the stacking like O2 structure, and also the surface coating to avoid uh, oxidation and gas release, and also the side reaction. So there are a lot of effort still need to be, uh, to be paid and to improve the performance. So that's my idea. <laughs> Kisek. Hey, um, I think I view uh, this kind of uh, uh, movement uh, roadmap uh, using uh, uh, like a silicon high high capacity anode and with a uh, low capacity cathode uh, like lithium ion phosphate. Uh, I view this one as uh, uh, the uh, technical uh, difficulties in making safe enough and cost-effective enough batteries. So in ideal situation, of course, uh, you have to adopt uh, the high capacity cathode when you put the, when you employ the uh, silicon high energy ones, not reducing the capacity of the uh, cathode. But the problem is that when you make the uh, anode uh, as a silicon, there are so many, so much problems like safety and the cost. Uh, even though there are gains, large gains in the energy density. So the only practical uh, options to uh, like uh, mitigate these to, uh, is to compensate uh, the use of cathode so that we can have a better safety and then uh, a little bit less cost. So if you use this high nickel ones, then this safety one is going to be double times more uh, the dangers and the cost is going to be like that. So it is not practically feasible. That's why I think uh, uh, the cathode side, they had to compensate 
uh, but overall energy density is going to be plus because you have higher energy density in silicon uh, despite, despite, of, uh, uh, despite the low capacity one. So um, it is not going to be the ultimate answer, but it can be an alternative uh, way before we fully accomplish high energy cathode and high energy and in the full cell. Thank you, Kisuk. Maybe I can also uh, build off this question a little bit more. So certainly um, when I look around in the United States, there are many innovators in the anode area, right? Um, there are dozens of companies trying to commercialize and scale up manufacturing of silicon and so forth, uh, uh, and also companies uh, like Ampries that came out of Stanford. But when I look for the cathode side, in the United States, uh, there is very little innovation um, in, the, in, in the startup world. So I wanted to ask uh, Hong and Kisuk, in China and Europe, uh, in, in, in China and North, uh, South Korea, is there a similar trend of a emphasis on the anode versus the cathode? And if so, why is this the case? Um, why do we see this trend? And this is a little bit related to my first question as well. Uh, Hong, could we get your thoughts? <laughs> Yes, that's the same same case in China also. <coughs> because for the cancer, you know, this is quite costly. So in China, we have top ten uh, manufacturers. Uh, each company has been supported by large investing. So for the anode side, it's not necessary to have such kind of large investing to initiate a company. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, the progress in the cancer side is not very uh, quickly. So uh, uh, the the progress is kind of a uh, gradually step by step. So from the nickel, like 80 to the 84, 88, 90, like mentioned by Kisuk also. So this kind of uh, progress need not uh, to have a new company to compete with uh, uh, current uh, companies. It's not, it's really hard. But for the anode side, the silicon is not uh, easy uh, to be fabricated by the, uh, the previous company. So you have the possibility to have the new, company in China, I think also we are the one of the startup company to produce the silicon, including Empress also and others. But, uh, but still, uh, we have uh, some company, startup company to produce the lithium rich cancer. This is just the beginning. There are three companies try to produce the lithium rich cancer. Uh, some application does not require very high cycle life, but it require high uh, uh, and its density and also the uh, does not care about voltage range because listen range has a wide voltage range so i think the progress of the cancer in near future uh, also will appear some new one uh, i for, for my opinion the listen rich is one of the uh, possibility and also the modification of the re, uh, current cancer will become a very important directions uh, because to increase the safety and increase and the possibility to use in the solid state battery, you need to change the, you need to modify current uh, cathode materials. So I, I still can see the opportunity in the uh, next three years to have a cathode uh, effort. Uh, I'm not sure in USA or, or in, in other countries, but I, I'm sure in China we will have such kind of new company to produce the new cathode. Kisuk, what's the Korean perspective? So um, in Korea, uh, we can say, we, as I said, we have uh, uh, three major battery manufacturers. Uh, uh, compared to the United States and compared to China, we are a relatively small country, but still we have three major companies. And then uh, those three major companies have a very uh, good, very well established supply chain of materials. So. Uh, practically, it is a little bit difficult to uh, uh, for the small venture company to penetrate into this uh, established supply chain. I think that's why uh, some uh, the activities of uh, small companies uh, working on this new electrode chemistry is not uh, so. I mean, there are some, but not very much uh, active uh, like China or, or in uh, in the United States. Uh, but if you look at the uh, so. So my, my interpretation about more companies on the anode side is because uh, if you are, if you are the, like a beginning company, like a startup company, your idea should be distinct from the conventional one, okay? So you have to start from some other material that has not been covered from the conventional one. Uh, and uh, 
let, let me let me say this. So in the material science point of view, uh, the anode has a more variety of the chemistry than the cathode. It is because anode by definition requires material with high lithium chemical potential. And there are so many materials that can uh, observe or store lithium at a relatively high chemical potential. On the other hand, high redox voltage cathode, which requires very low stable lithium storage, uh, low chemical potential is very seldom. You have to have a very well structured material like a layer or olivine or spinel like that. So the, in terms of the variety of the chemistry, there are much more variety the end, uh, in the case. So that's why there are some, I think, more chances for the startup companies to dig into the new chemistry for the anode. Uh, that's a one of my interpretation uh, from the academic uh, point of view. So anyhow, uh, so, uh, uh, and then if I add one more thing, uh, uh, the culture in uh, the battery research culture in Korea is like uh, we are focusing more on the practical uh, materials. Uh, rather than like a very challenging uh, materials to be adopted because of uh, uh, the three major, com major companies, uh, we have very much common sense what material is going to work and what material is not going to work. Seeing the, uh, the, uh, the pre-existing line uh, or the manufacturing processes. So uh, in the lab scale, university or research lab scale, uh, you can see that, oh, this material is great. It works well and the high intensity cycle very well. But if you look at the line or the company side, there are so many other things you have to consider. So once you have those ideas, it's a little bit difficult for uh, uh, one person to pursue this new chemistry uh, to uh, the existing line. Kisuk, what a great point. Um, our speaker from two, two weeks ago also commented on the 10 year duration between lab and product, right? So I think you just uh, further emphasize this point. Um, you know, both of you are working between academia and industry. Do you, what do you see as the opportunity to really shorten this 10 year time frame, right? From introduction in the lab and prototype all the way to the product. What's the opportunity here? And maybe you guys are already practicing this now uh, Hong, can I ask you to share your thoughts on maybe how do we spend not 10 years, but five years for the next iteration? Okay. Uh, me or Hong? Oh, whoever would like to go first. Kisa, yes. it sounds like you have something to say. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, as I briefly mentioned about the culture of uh, research in, the ba uh, in Korea, battery research culture uh, in Korea, uh, for the past 10 years, I have been uh, more than 10 years here in Korea working uh, in the academia. Uh, I, I thought that, uh, as I said, uh, the, the discovery and invention in the laboratory uh, does not necessarily uh, lead to the uh, successful employment in the commercial sector. And as I have more uh, the, uh, the interactions with the company, I realized that there are some reasons. Okay, so nowadays uh, uh, our strategy is that we actively collaborate in industry. For example, we supply, we get supply from uh, uh, like a, uh, the company like a, a precursors or other real practical materials. Uh, and then start from that reliable precursors and then develop our own ideas. So in that way, uh, we can reduce the, the, uh, uh, the steps uh, that uh, in some laboratory, we have to start from like very uh, low level precursors and then develop here. And then once you bring those material to the real uh, site, then somehow there are so many problems in each step. So then we can reduce those kind of steps. So uh, we have a multiple joint program uh, in our university, in our lab with the companies. Uh, to work together so that we often communicate what's the real practical point of view and what's the uh, future from the fundamentals. So we work together so that I think it actually uh, very much expedites uh, uh, the speed uh, of the development. Okay, so this this is a really difficult topic. And I have also the same experience. I 
uh, because we have set up an institute called Tim Lake Institute for Advanced Energy Storage. The purpose of this institute is to accelerate this transfer technology. Because for scientists, a lot of scientists have new ideas, but have no place to do the pilot production and the demonstration. And for the company, normally for most of big company, they have no time to wait for you to, to direct, uh, to demonstrate from the lab to the large scale production. So if there are platform which can help the scientists or other smart team to demonstrate and scale up in the pilot level, so that we are, uh, could, uh, could uh, accelerate this transfer speed. Uh, such kind of platform, I think not so many uh, in, the, in the world actually. Yes, this is, uh, we have this kind of third party. Uh, so now we have a, a kind of so-called scientist studio uh, system. So we, uh, we attract the seven scientists from the university and institute to do the technology development. You know, in this institute, we have a uh, lot of facilities, not only for the testing, but also for the uh, fabricate the big batteries and the st uh, industry standards. So if the scientists have original idea, he can scale up the materials in this institute and also uh, test and fabricate the battery with the engineer's help and design test with the industry standard and also do the uh, simulations. After that, then you can tell the, uh, uh, the, uh, the company, is this technology really promising or not? The most difficult thing is, the, sometimes some scientists think it's uh, a promising, but for industry people, the cost is an issue and also processing technology is, is not available. So you need some kind of the platform to uh, bridge the gap between the, uh, the, uh, between the company and the scientists. That's my idea. And also that's our effort in the last three years to do this. And uh, I think this is one thing, but another thing is of course, if the scientist has some original, very important idea, you can directly transfer technology to the large company. They have the very, uh, big uh, teams to do this. this there are two choices, but the last one, depending on whether scientists would like to see the idea or not. Sometimes it's an, the, the big company do not want to pay much money to the scientists. Okay. <laughs> There's a message there. Um, yeah. So we're coming to the end of our uh, session here. I thought maybe I would solicit your advice. So I think, you know, there's been a lot of development in the United States, just even in the past month. And you have seen announcement from um, the, the national leadership expressing that we need to have better supply chain of battery technology in the United States. And I think it goes without saying that we are catching up to Korea, to China as well. So what would be your advice to the United States as we now sort of realize the importance of this aspect and trying to play catch up here. What would be, you know, if uh, our president knock on your door and ask, you know, what would uh, Professor Kong and Professor Lee tell us? Uh, can you share with us your uh, insights and recommendations to the US government? Wow, this is an even very difficult and sensitive topic. So I, I know the question from the ESGC discussion. So ESGC want to, uh, to build up this kind of leadership in the, uh, in the innovation chain, in the production chain, in also the human, uh, the, the intelligent, intelligent people's chains to form a very developed chain, but it takes time. So if you want to do this, so from the raw material to the precursor to the key materials and also to the <clears throat> machines and the fabrication of the cell modular pack and also the BMS and the control system and the sensor. Such kind of the whole production chain should be developed at the same time. If you check the investment, so in China, Korea and uh, Japan and European. So right now from the big company, the investment is a uh, huge money now. Uh, I think much higher than USA. So this competition and also the, the, the investment is a really may not be in the same level now. So firstly, a big investment. And secondly, you need to uh, attract people to do this because doing the battery business is a tough, tough experience. Yes, you cannot see a high price. You, you, you have only choice to see a cheaper 
battery compared to the Asia's product. That's very tough experience of cost for USA because the labor cost and also the material supply chain is not developed. So it's really tough, but I think uh, uh, if you want to do this, you have to do step by step and from the raw material to the finer, uh, finer the systems. So there, there are no other uh, fast pass. There are no, no, no the short circuit chance. Okay, uh, I think uh, uh, it's a very difficult question, uh, uh, but uh, the battery business is going to be is going to become huge. Okay, uh, we often compare with the semiconductor uh, or the conventional car company. I mean, car uh, uh, paradigm is may change. Uh, in that respect, the battery is going to play a pivotal pivotal role in here, and then the national competition uh, is going to become much more harder and harder. But I think we have to, uh, so that's why you, that's why I think maybe you, uh, United States, uh, the researchers or uh, the people in the battery field maybe go to the uh, politicians and then uh, look at this, uh, this business uh, as a whole. But if you look at a little, we have to, I think, but we have to look at this matter from a little bit more, uh, from the bigger point of view, okay? Uh, the battery, uh, uh, we, as a whole of the uh, international, uh, uh, international, or as a, uh, the effort to shift, convert from conventional fossil uh, uses to this uh, more environmental friendly kind of a way uh, to the electric vehicles. I mean, there will be some national competitions, but it, this movement should be go together as a whole team. Okay, uh, so. Uh, United States, China, and uh, Japan and Korea uh, as a major kind of a battery research, researching and uh, production ones. We have to work together, uh, not only from the like a solely national kind of interest or national point of view, but from the whole uh, like uh, international uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, aspects. Actually, the basic research and also the data analysis and also large facility experience are really leading the world uh, from USA. They contribute a lot to uh, our engine idea, but the, the problem is how to uh, scale up those kind of new, uh, new ideas because there are very few better battery uh, factories in USA. So without big factory companies, so it's hard to transfer all the technology, all the uh, original idea to the, to the real one. That's the problem. Problem. This, if you want to solve, you can consider uh, introduce uh, some big battery companies from Asia or uh, from USA itself. And then, of course, as Kisio comment, so the battery is a uh, connected connected business. It's, it's hard to separate to separate from the country. Each country contributes some key materials or key technologies. Right now, that's that's the case already. <laughs> Well, these are excellent messages, and I hope uh, if there are government leaders listening that they have taken a lot of notes uh, from our colleagues in China and Korea. So Hong and Kisuk, I want to thank you again for taking your morning to share your technical insights, but also higher level insight for the battery industry. Uh, I really have uh, learned a lot, and I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you very much. And um, I just want to briefly uh, share with the audience that we have several exciting events coming up that is hosted by Stanford's StorageX initiative. We have two talks uh, that are going to be given by uh, students and postdocs at Stanford. Um, you can see here, um, we're going to have talks on modeling of degradation as well as on uh, safe uh, design uh, for lithium ion batteries. So you can sign up for these talks um, that are given by Stanford students. And two weeks from tomorrow, we will also have another very exciting uh, symposium. Um, we're still finalizing the speaker, but the topic will be a very crucial one, which is the sustainability of um, battery materials. Uh, so I hope you will join us two weeks from tomorrow at our usual time to learn more about sustainability. With that, I would like to close today's session and thank you everyone for joining and thanks to Hong and Kisu again for taking the time.